We've been asking, God, where are you in these difficult times in our life? A couple of things that we've learned so far. One is that when we cry out to God, the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus is able to help. And that phrase, able to help, literally means runs to the cry. That's because Jesus knows what our cries sound like. And so he is able to run to us to help us. When he comes to us, often we want to say, how long is this going to take place? How long am I going to be in this trial? And whenever we ask those questions, God never points to a date on the calendar. He never points to a time on the clock. But he calls us to trust him because he is doing something. See, part of our problem is when we call to God for help and we really believe that Jesus comes running to us, One of the things that we have a tendency to do in our own minds is to then give God the game plan. When he shows up, we say, this is what I want you to do to deliver me from this. And this is what the time frame is. We tell him how long we're willing to stay in that difficult time in our life and what he needs to do to get us out of it. But that's not what God is going to do. When God comes to us, he's coming to us to say, Trust me, I'm going to take you through this trial, and I am accomplishing something. In fact, in just a couple of minutes, we're going to look here on the at the scripture that tells us that he is accomplishing something that is for our good and that is for his glory. And sometimes we want to say, okay, God, but what are you doing? Boy, if you, if you could tell me just what you are doing in this trial, maybe that would help me stay in it just a little bit longer. Well, sometimes we get a chance to see what God's doing and sometimes we don't. But what the Bible tells us is that all of us are groaning, even creation. Listen to what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, and you can hear almost some of that same kind of how long frustration, some of that groaning, but you can also are going to see in this the anticipation of what's coming. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. Um, He says this, creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. So even creation is looking forward to what's going to happen with us. For the creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Now, listen to then our groaning. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And I would add, sometimes our groans aren't just inwardly, as Paul says here in Romans chapter 8. Sometimes our groans are outwardly too. But then Paul goes on to say this, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. As we saw last week, in BC 31, do you think that the Israelites there were able to see and understand that Caesar Augustus was beginning to create the environment in which God could eventually send his son as our Messiah? I don't think so. What about several years later when the plague hit Rome and most people ran from the plague, but here's the Christians running into the plague. They're running to the cries of help, much like Jesus runs to our cries. Do you think that in that time of difficulty that those Christians could see and understand that what they were doing was sending a message that years down the road would reverberate to Emperor Constantine so that he would eventually convert to Christianity himself? Probably not. William Tyndale translated the Bible into English, and as a result of that, he was martyred for doing that. Do you think William Tyndale, uh, with in his dying prayer, where he said, Lord, open the eyes of the king, 
Do you think that he knew at that moment that just two years later on, King Henry VIII was going to order that the Coverdale Bible, which was based on William Tyndale's work, was going to be used as the official Bible in all of the parishes in England? Probably not. You see, God was doing something and they didn't get a chance to see the fulfillment of what it was that he was doing. It's very similar to what we see in the book of Hebrews. In chapter 11, there's all of these people that are listed. I like to call that that, that chapter the Hall of Fame of Faith. All of these people that stood firm through some really challenging times to see what God was doing, and they never really got to see the final result of it. And so the closing two verses of Hebrews 11 say this, These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. You see, all of those heroes of the faith listed in Hebrews 11, they never got a chance to see the final result. But here the writer of Hebrews says that we are actually a part of taking the baton from them And that God is still accomplishing something. So what is God doing in our waiting time? In our groaning time, like this trial that we're going through, how long is this going to last? What is God doing? Well, I can't tell you specifically what he's doing in your life. What he's doing in your life is specific to you. But I would like to share with you today, because I think the Bible shows us at least five principles, five things that God is doing in everyone's life through these times of trial, these painful groaning periods. The first thing that he's doing is God is opening our eyes to new paradigms, new perspectives. I can speak for myself that the challenging chapters that I've gone through, that there's been passages of scripture that I've read, and I know that I've read them before, And all of a sudden, I have a brand new insight on them. I see them in a new light, in a new setting that I had had never seen before. A couple weeks ago, I told you about a painful chapter in my life that I went through. And during that time, especially in the Psalms, there were some of the prayers that David prayed that I I know I had read them before because I could even see the highlight marks there in my Bible. But when I read them now, going through this chapter, all of a sudden, I began to say, boy, David sounds like me. He sounds like he was going through exactly what I'm going through right now. And I was able to take those Psalms and make it a prayer of my own. Just as I came out of that chapter in my life, I came across a poem from Robert Browning Hamilton, a short little verse, but I have kept this thing close by because boy, does it ring true. Here's what he wrote. I walked a mile with pleasure. She chattered all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and ne'er a word said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. How true that is. That's something that God is doing, is he is giving us a new perspective. We're learning lessons that we wouldn't have learned any other way. Not only is he doing that for us, but the other thing that he's doing for us too is building in us an empathy that we wouldn't have had before. I like what one dictionary, how it describes the word empathy, the power of understanding and imaginatively entering into another person's feelings. Understanding and imaginatively entering in to another person's feelings. See, when I came through this time of this difficult chapter, this really painful trial in my life, You know what I discovered after that? That times when people would be sharing with me about some of the challenges that they went through, that I could look at them and say this to them. I can only imagine what you must be going through right now. How frustrated you are, how painful this must be. I don't have any personal experience. I just have to imagine what it might be like. But there were other people that I could come alongside them and say, put my arm around them and say, you know what? I've walked down a road very similar to this. And I have a hunch that you're feeling what I felt. And here's what I felt. And here's what helped me through it. 
And here's the lesson that I learned on the other side. But I wouldn't have gathered that. I wouldn't have learned that in my life if I had not gone through this chapter. So when we're going through these things, God is giving us a new perspective on things. He's building empathy in our life. The third thing that he's doing for us is growing our patience. We, we shared this verse from Romans chapter 5 last week. And um, it, it has the patience right here at the beginning. It says, we also have joy with our troubles because we know that these troubles produce patience. Interesting. Troubles produce patience. Now, it's been said that patience is the mother of all the other virtues. And that's true if you think about it this way. Like, for instance, um, how am I going to learn, like we just talked about empathy, how am I going to learn to empathize with people if I don't have the patience to ride out the difficult time I'm going through, if I bail out of that soon? How am I going to learn the virtue of courage if I run away too soon? And on and on through the list it goes. How am I going to learn those other virtues if my patience doesn't allow me to hang in there a little bit longer? I like this quote from F.B. Meyer. <laughs> Boy, this is, uh, these are one of these quotes that I like to say, ouch and amen. It's true, but boy, it's, it's kind of painful uh, to hear these words. But here's what F.B. Meyer wrote. We pray for patience for many years. And when something begins to test us beyond our endurance, we run from it. We try to avoid it. We see it as some insurmountable obstacle to our desired goal. And we believe that if it was removed, we would experience immediate deliverance and victory. He said, this is not true. We would simply see the temptations to be impatient and this would not be patience. The only way genuine patience can be acquired is by enduring the very trials that seem so unbearable today. What we're going through today is building patience for tomorrow. That's one of the reasons why God allows us to go through these things, to strengthen us so that we can go a little bit farther the next time. So what is God doing Number one, he's giving us a new perspective. Number two, he's building empathy in us. Number three, he's helping to grow or expand our patience. And then following right along in that Romans 5 passage, the fourth thing he's doing is refining his character in us. Romans 5 goes on to say that these troubles produce patience and patience produces character. God's character is being refined in us. You know, in our times of challenge, that's when we discover some of the things that we had been relying on that aren't so reliable. I know for me, I found that my some of my own skill sets, some of my own knowledge that I had acquired from before, I was leaning to that instead of leaning on God. And going through this allowed me to say, this is a deficiency in my character. This is a weakness because it's not... God honoring because it's not God dependent. It was Craig dependent. And so God had to use this time to shake me free from that. Again, listen to these words from Oswald Chambers. Jesus Christ does not give us power to work up a patience like his own. His patience and his character is manifested if we will let his life dwell in us. It's like in John chapter 15, when Jesus talks about he's the vine and we are the branches. And he said, I want you to abide in me. I want you to stay connected to me. You know what tends to happen in the good times? We tend to say, I got this and want to go off on our own. How foolish is that? Because how fruitful is a branch going to be if it detaches from the vine? Now, the leaves might not fall off immediately. The fruit might not drop immediately, but already it's cut itself off from the source. It can't sustain itself. It has to stay attached. And so what Oswald Chambers is reminding us is that we don't have to try to like work up this patience. If we stay as a branch connected to the vine, if we abide in Jesus, then his patience and his character just naturally flow into our lives. We don't have to ask for it to flow. It just flows because we're abiding, we're attached, we're connected to him. But these times of trial 
have to sometimes show us the deficiencies in our characters, the things that are not exhibiting Christ-like, God-like characteristics. And he takes us through these challenges. So he gives us a new perspective. He develops empathy in us. He helps us grow and expand our patience. He puts more and refines his character in us. And then again, number five, following right along with with Romans chapter five, troubles produce patience, patience produces character, and character produces hope. The fifth thing that God is doing for us in these trials is that he is building in us an unshakable, solid hope in God's future grace. See, hope, friends, is not wishful thinking. It's well-founded believing. Let me say that again. Hope doesn't mean that I cross in my fingers and and I kind of hope that when I take the next step that it's not over the edge of the cliff. Hope is a well-founded belief that I look back over my shoulder and I see the steps that I've taken along the way. I see God's provision along the way. And I remind myself that God is faithful, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, and forever. And so hope is a well-founded belief that I can take the next step and know that he's there. Listen to what John Piper wrote. Hope is the confidence that the stupendous future promised to us by the word of the Spirit is going to really come true. Therefore, the way to be filled with the Spirit is to be filled with his word. The way to have the power of the Spirit is to believe the promises of his word. Now, I want to circle back just for a moment to this word refine or refining. I mentioned that as the, the one of the things that God does for us is in these times of trial is that he is refining our character. I, I like that word because that really is what's happening. The idea of refining is getting rid of some of the things that are not as valuable so that we can lean on the things that are valuable or even priceless. God is working all things together for our good and for his glory. So we read this passage in Romans chapter 8 about groaning and waiting for this to come about. I want to back up and I want to read the four verses preceding what I just read before, but I want to read it out of the Amplified version because, I, well, it amplifies it. And and I, I think that you'll really grasp this well. So this is Romans chapter 8, verses 15 to 18 out of the Amplified Bible. For the spirit which you have now received is not a spirit of slavery to put you once more in bondage to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, the spirit producing sonship in us, the bliss of which we cry, Abba, Father, The Spirit himself thus testifies together with our own spirit, assuring us that we are children of God. And if we are his children, then we are his heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, sharing his inheritance with him. Now check this. Only we must suffer his suffering if we are to share his glory. We must share his suffering if we are to share his glory. But what of that? For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, this present life, are not worth being compared with the glory that is about to be revealed to us and in us and for us and conferred on us. Wow. What we're going through right now doesn't even compare to what's coming. I want you to hear the words that Peter wrote in his first letter, 1 Peter chapter 1, and I want you to hear how much those echo these words that we just read from Romans chapter 8. The th- same thoughts are there, but I want you to listen for this word refined as well in here. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Listen to this. Kept in heaven for you. That's a pretty safe place for it to be, right? 
who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, now it just sounds exactly like what we read in Romans, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now listen, friends, you might say, well, I I have faith to believe this. And I might say back to you, great. Is it genuine faith? What is your faith really worth? Now, now don't, don't take offense at me asking those questions because let me ask it a different way. Let's say that I work in an assayer's office, somebody who tells you the value of precious metals, and you come in with a rock and you say to me, I have silver ore in this rock. I really believe I have silver ore in this rock. And I say, great. How pure is it? What exactly is its worth? How do we find out the worth of the silver inside that ore, inside that rock? There's only one way to do it. It has to go through the fire. Only the fire is going to reveal the purity. Only the fire is going to refine and remove the impurities so that what we have left is the pure silver. Listen, what what Peter said here. He said that we're going to be refined by fire. And it's only on the other side of that refining process that Peter says that we can say not only I have faith, but I have faith that brings praise, glory, and honor to Jesus Christ. That we can say, I have faith, and it fills me with an inexpressible and glorious joy. So where is God during this trial, during the heat of this time? Where is he? Oh, friends, he is so close. Because he is sitting there as the perfect refiner, overseeing your life as you go through the fire. This perfect refiner, our perfect God that had a plan in place and had a time in place before time even began, he knows the perfect temperature. He knows the precise time to bring such purity and beauty from your life. Do you know how a silversmith knows when he has refined the silver, when he has purified it from all of the ugliness, from all of the impurities, he sits next to the fire and he heats up that ore and he begins to skim off the top that comes up, all the impurities that come off. He begins to skim them off. And the way that that silversmith knows that he has a pure product is when he pulls it out of the fire and he looks into the silver and he can see his own reflection. How beautiful. That's what God is doing for you and for me during these fires that we go through. He's scraping off those impurities and then he's looking to see his reflection coming back to him. He's looking to see his character revealed in your life. So he doesn't just put you in the fire and say, see you later and walk away. A silversmith doesn't do that. A silversmith doesn't take that silver ore and just put it into the crucible and stick it in the fire and leave and go and have lunch and run some errands and some chores and then come back. He would never do that. He puts it in and then he watches and he's attentive and he's removing the impurities that are coming up to the top. Our loving Heavenly Father is doing the same thing for us. He's right there. Now, as I said earlier, 
Sometimes we get a chance to see what God is doing. And sometimes we don't get a chance to see what he's doing. I told you the story of, say, William Tyndale. He died. He did not see the answer to his prayer where he prayed, Lord, open the eyes of the king. He didn't see that in his lifetime. And sometimes, friends, sometimes you're not going to see the results of what God is doing in this trial, in this refining time. Sometimes you will. A couple of years ago, uh, or a few years ago, I I told you about this uh, two weeks ago, about the difficult chapter that I went through. Boy, I prayed that prayer a lot. God, what are you doing? What are you accomplishing here? What are you trying to refine in my life? What what is going on? And 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 I didn't see it I, 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 all the way up to the time. And for those of you that didn't see that message two weeks ago, I was viciously attacked. My character was maligned and r- drugged through the mud by people that had called me to this church to ask me to lead them through a time of transition, and now they turned against me. And I, and I was baffled at what was going on. I didn't realize until later how God was putting me in this fire and then scraping the impurities off of me. The last Sunday that we were at this church was Palm Sunday. And on Easter Sunday, we went to a friend's church to attend a church service there for Easter Sunday. And I looked over and I was surprised to see a family, not the mom and the kids, because they had been attending church. They lived right next door to us, uh, to the church building. And and so they would come frequently and, and I would interact with them quite a bit. But I was surprised to see dad there. I'll call him Bill. That's not his name, but I'll just call him Bill. We had had some casual interactions, but he had not attended church. He was not involved with what what, uh, was happening in our churches. But he was there on that Easter Sunday morning. And after the service, and we had chatted with people for a while, I said to Betsy, I'm going to go pick up the car. I had to park way in the backside of the parking lot. So I'm going to go get the car and I'll pull it up to the door for you and the kids. And Bill said to me, hey, uh, can I walk with you? And I said, sure. We barely got out of the doors of the church And he stopped me and he says, you know, this morning in that service, when that pastor asked people if they wanted to invite Jesus into their heart and ask him to pray, if they would pray along with him. And I said, Joe, sure. Yeah, I heard that. And he said, I prayed that prayer this morning. I invited Jesus to come into my life. I turned my heart over to him. And I said, oh man, Bill, I'm so excited. That is, that's the best decision you could ever make. And he said, you know why I did that? I said, no, why why did did you do that? He said, because I watched what you went through. I watched all the ugliness. I watched the way that people mistreated you. And I watched how you came out on the other side, still trusting God. And I said to myself, if he can still trust God after all of that, it must be the real deal. And one week later, he gave his life to Jesus. Sometimes we get to see it. Sometimes we don't. But God is doing something. Friends, listen. Listen to me. I can tell you from my life, I've said it before, I wouldn't have wished that trial in my life on my worst enemy. But neither would I go back and skip that, miss out on it. Because when I came out of that thing, I had a new perspective I'd never had before. I had greater empathy for people going through difficult times than I ever had before. God developed in me bigger patience. He refined his character in me, and he made my hope in what he was doing even more solid and rock secure than it had ever been before. And as an added bonus, I got to see somebody who gave their heart to Jesus. Friends, the trial that you're going through It may be hot and it may be painful, but I promise you, God has not put you in this fire and just left you there. He has put you there and he is watching carefully. He is perfectly regulating the heat and the time and he is removing impurities. And you're going to come out of this shining with his character more than when you went into it. Don't bail out of the process early of what God wants to do. Someone's soul may hang in the balance 
A whole nation's fate may hang in the balance because you are willing to trust God through this process. Listen again to these words that Peter said. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Friends, God is doing something for you. I can't tell you specifically what he's going to do in your life, but I can promise you, you're going to come out with a new perspective, with a greater empathy, with bigger patience, with more of God's character refined in your life, and with your hope more solid and secure, a well-founded belief that you have for what God is doing. Can I pray for you this morning? Father, my friends are going through trials. In fact, if they're not going through them now, they're, they're going to be going through them. We face trials all the time in our life. And I pray that you would speak to my friends' hearts right now and you would remind them, you would assure them that what they're going through right now is just for a little while. And the glory that they are going to experience on the other side is not worthy of compare with the pain that they're going through in the hot oven right now. God, assure them that you are right there as the perfect silversmith. You are attentively watching. You know the perfect temperature and the perfect time. You're developing in them a new perspective. You're building empathy into them. You're expanding their patience. You are refining their character so that more of you can be revealed in them and you are strengthening their hope. Oh, remind them, God, remind them of what you're doing in this time. And Lord, I pray for my friends today that might be watching this, that they don't know what it is to have a personal relationship with Jesus. And even now, everything that they have tried to put their trust in seems so unstable and so unsure. Would you speak to their hearts this assurance that a trust in you is a well-founded belief? That if they place their hope and their confidence, their faith in what you did for us, Jesus, you died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. So now there is nothing that need ever separate us from God's presence. So friend, if that's you, if you've never prayed a prayer like this before, pray something like this. Jesus, you died for my sins. And I place my faith in that, my well-founded belief in that. And Heavenly Father, I ask you then to forgive me of my sins. Let your spirit come and take residence in my heart. Give me a brand new start from this day forward as my Lord and as my Savior. Amen. I love you, friends. Stay in the process. Don't bail out. God is doing something Amazing. I love you. I look forward to seeing you soon.